What's up everybody? Welcome to another Proof Friday. Hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles because in this video I'm going to prove the limit uniqueness theorem which means I'm going to prove that if a limit exists then it is unique. And what prompted me to make this video was that I was looking at this theorem for whatever reason a couple of weeks ago it came up, I thought of it, and I realized that I've always been proving this using proof by contradiction but that I could prove this directly and the work for the proof is actually almost equivalent, right? And I personally think it's just as convincing. So I wanted to show the direct proof for this and at the end show how you would change that to prove it using contradiction and then invite you to decide for yourselves what you think is better, what you think is more convincing, that sort of thing. So also I've been doing a lot of limit proofs on these Proof Friday segments, so it was pretty fitting to just go ahead and throw in. So let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna prove the limit uniqueness theorem. So this is it written out formally. If the limit of a function exists as x approaches p and equals L1, and the limit of that same function as x approaches that same number exists and equals L2, then L1 must equal L2. And if you know a little bit about limits, then this should be pretty intuitive. You should be nodding your head. Yeah, for sure, this is true. Well, now we're gonna prove it formally. So if we're proving this directly, what we're gonna do is assume the premise, which is this and this, and try to show the conclusion, which is L1 equals L2 is true. So we're gonna assume this whole top line is true and try to arrive at L1 equals L2, right? If you're doing contradiction, you're gonna assume this whole top line is true and that L1 does not equal L2 and try to arrive at a contradiction, right? So two different ways, slightly different. I'm gonna go ahead and stick with the direct proof and assume or suppose, I guess, either way, same thing, this whole line, right? That's how I'm gonna start my proof. And maybe even before this, you would have like let F be a function, you would be a little more clear with this. I have limited space, so I'm, I'm starting out here and I'm being a little lazy and saying assume this whole line, okay? So from here, we're gonna let epsilon be greater than zero. Now, if you've done some of these limit proofs or if you've watched some of these Proof Friday segments, you should be getting the hang of how to structure these proofs around you know, the limit laws and with limits in general. We can let epsilon be given an arbitrary number greater than zero and then we can pick a delta, right? So that's exactly what we're gonna do here. We're gonna say there exists delta and I'm gonna say delta one and delta two. There exists delta one. So the delta one goes with the L one, right? That's the one that makes this work. The delta two goes with the L two, okay? There exists delta one for that expression there, delta two for this limit expression there, such that, and I'm gonna do a quick fast forward because it's gonna take me a minute to write this out. All right, so everything I have so far is really just from the definition of a limit. Since this limit exists and equals L1, that means for any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta one, right? Such that if, et cetera, et cetera. And then for this limit expression, we have for any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta two, such that if, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this first line sort of goes with our L1 limit and this second line goes with our L2, but we wanna be able to work with both of these and that's why we need a delta that makes both of these true, right? Because if this holds, then this holds, and if this holds, then this holds. So we need both of these to hold, so it's a very common thing that we see where we pick delta to be the minimum. I've done it in when I proved the limit laws and some of, some of my other videos, but we should be comfortable with this by now. Pick delta to be the minimum of delta one, delta two. And what this does is it guarantees, this guarantees then if, zero is less than, that has a value of x minus p is less than delta, right? That means this absolute value of x minus p is less than whichever is smaller of the two, which means it's definitely less than both, right? So these both definitely hold. That should be pretty intuitive. Then if this is true, we have, and this is where the proof gets a little tricky. There's just a couple of tricks. We're gonna add a sneaky zero is really what's gonna happen. So we're gonna start with absolute value of L1 minus L2, okay? And what we really wanna show is that this is less than epsilon for any epsilon greater than zero. Because if that's true, then L1 has to equal L2, right? And if you don't believe me, pull out a scratch piece of paper, you can actually prove this, that if two real numbers 
if the absolute value of the difference of two real numbers is less than epsilon for any epsilon greater than zero, then they're equal, right? So you can prove that off to the side. It should be pretty intuitive though. So we wanna start with this and we need a string of inequalities and we wanna end up with less than epsilon. And since epsilon was chosen arbitrarily greater than zero, L1 equals L2. In order to get that, we need two little tricks that we're gonna use. First of all, we're gonna add zero in sort of a sneaky way. And second of all, we're gonna use the triangle inequality, which isn't really a trick. It's used so commonly that you should be comfortable with that by now. The adding the zero part is really the only part that's, you know, may not be obvious to most people. I know it wasn't for me. So we're gonna add f of x and subtract f of x. So we're not literally just plus zero, right? That would be pointless, but we're gonna plus f of x minus f of x, which equals zero. So we're gonna say this equals L1 minus L2 plus f of x minus f of x. And maybe you can see why I did this. The reason why I did this is because now I have f of x twice and I have L1 and L2. So I can now use the triangle inequality and I can split this up so I have two expressions that look like these two expressions up here, okay? So I'm gonna group, let's see, I have f of x minus L2 and then L1 minus f of x. So L1 minus f of x, absolute value, plus, and this is by triangle inequality, by the way. Maybe I should write that, but it's used so commonly that usually you don't have to write it. f of x minus L2, is this right? So I'm gonna erase the less than epsilon, but that's really what I wanna show. I'll put it really tiny in the quarter. I wanna show less than epsilon. So this actually confused me. This is kind of embarrassing because it's really dumb kind of, but I was like, wait a minute, I have L1 minus F of X. I need F of X minus L1. And I got kind of stuck for a few minutes and this was way back when I was taking like analysis one, but then it hit me. Oh yeah, absolute value. I can interchange these, I can swap them, same thing, right? The distance between two real numbers is the same as, right? You can swap them, the absolute value. So I'm just gonna go ahead and erase and swap them. And I know that sounds silly, but I did get stumped for a few minutes thinking how am I gonna get f of x minus l1. Okay, and now we have from our statements up here, since we've chosen our delta that ensures that both of these hold, we can say this is less than epsilon plus epsilon, which equals two epsilon, but I wanna make it real clean. I wanna end up with epsilon just cause it's cleaner. So I'm gonna go back and change these to epsilon over two. And the reason why I didn't do that immediately is because I always want to enforce that proofs are not something that, or at least for me and for most people will agree with this, it's not something where you can look at something you're trying to prove, put pencil to paper and just write out a foolproof perfect and be done, right? A lot of times it is like trying something, realizing you need to adjust something further up on the page, going back, adjusting that. So that's why I do my proofs this way in my videos. It's not because I don't know what I'm doing. It's because I wanna show what actual mathematicians do, what people who are doing this, when, when I'm doing this, I get to a point where it's like, oh, I want epsilon, right? So I need to go back and change these to epsilon over two. So just to make clear on why I do that, there is a method to my madness. So epsilon over two plus epsilon over two, this equals epsilon. So now what we've shown is absolute value of L1 minus L2 is strictly less than epsilon for any epsilon greater than zero. Since epsilon, again, it's an arbitrary real number greater than zero, then L1 must equal L2, hence, result, this theorem is complete. So now I'm gonna show what would happen if you used a proof by contradiction. What you would do is you'd probably assume this whole first line and assume L1 does not equal L2. You do this whole process, you get to here and you'd say, well, since L1 minus L2, the absolute value is less than epsilon for any real number epsilon, uh, we have hence contradicted, right? You, it's basically the same proof. And there is a third way I've seen it done and I actually did think about this. If L1 does not equal L2, then there's some positive distance between the two, right? So you could pick your epsilons in a way that makes it contradict. Like for example, if you picked both these epsilons, and I'm not gonna show the full idea, I'm just gonna uh, kind of show what you would pick each of these epsilons to be. I'll just draw an arrow here. Maybe something like absolute value of L1 minus L2, and again, this is if you were doing proof by contradiction, over four, something like that, right? Because then what you would show is that when you assume that this top line is true and 
this part is false. In other words, the L1 does not equal L2. Since if you assume that, there would have to be some positive distance between the two. So that positive distance divided by four is still a positive distance. So you surely can pick an epsilon equal to that positive distance, right, greater than zero. And since these limits have to hold for every epsilon greater than zero, you can basically contradict this by showing that there's an epsilon greater than zero that doesn't work because what you're gonna get down here is L1 minus L2 over four plus L1 minus L2 over four. That's L1 minus L2 over two. And we're saying that that's somehow greater than L1 minus L2, which is a clear contradiction, right? We have a positive distance that's less than half that positive distance makes no sense. So that would be another contradiction. So there's three ways I know how to prove this, but let me know in the comments below what you think. Is this direct proof convincing enough? Do you prefer the contradiction? Do you prefer this contradiction? Is there maybe a contrapositive or something else you could do? Let me know in the comments below. Like, comment, subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Let me know what else you wanna see. But most importantly, keep flexing those brain muscles. See y'all later.